my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Barnaby and Olga Tuttle. We're at their home in Portland. It's June 22nd, 2020. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, first question for both of you. Uh, why wine? I'll let you answer that. <laughs> you started uh, you know, it's, it all. It's funny. I never really thought about it. Um, <laughs> I, I, so I guess the whole thing, I, before I came to wine, I'd worked back at house and restaurants, and I'd been a blue collar worker. Um, even though I live in this neighborhood, I've been basically a pretty blue collar guy. Um, I haven't changed the neighborhood has. Um, and, I, and I was working at Oregon Ironworks, and then um, eventually I wound up working at this place called Wildcat Auto Wrecking. Give a shout out to all my friends up there. It's an all vintage Mopar wrecking yard. Super great job, but it came to the point where I wanted to make some more money. So I hustled this job waiting tables at Papa Hyden, which I have a long history with, with those people. And it was my first time in front of the house. And I eventually got the job. And I was working, I think, 13 shifts a week. I was saving up to travel. And I was nudged to take wine classes. And um, wasn't real happy about it. Um, you know, I had this kind of idea that wine was Fraser Crane and all these pretentious rich people curling pinkies and talking about, oh, it smells like strawberries. And I just thought, this is crap showed up at the class in my 65 barracuda and you know and it was all blind silent tasting and we had to take notes we couldn't talk about it and i was pretty blown away i was like wow we're all writing down the same things without influencing each other so this is this is an actual real thing and the next week they got us blind silent again they didn't tell us but it was three pinot noirs same vintage, same winemaker. And they said, this is just different blends and vineyard sites. And there's this thing called terroir. And uh, that was it. And became very curious, started reading all these books. A year later, I was the wine buyer at the restaurant. And I've just never been good at like spectating. It's like, it's not enough. So I started making wine and tinkering, tinkering around and then planted this thing back here, this vin vineyard. And, uh, one thing led to another, and here we are. And I think it's because we like to make things, and wine's cool, and it's so fascinating that there's a food that tastes like the place that it's grown, and it's a great lifestyle. You know, our lives, it's not like working at a desk. You, know, you have harvest, you have bottling season, you have sales, and, you know, working in the vineyards, and so you're kind of changing with the seasons, and you never do the same job, and it's, every vintage is different, so me kind of can't get bored. What about you, Olga? What, what part do you, what point do you come into the story? Um, right, so Barnaby started making wine in the basement with fruit from this vineyard, and that was fun, and I think I helped you bottle your first vintage. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but it wasn't until Barnaby started really seriously considering it, and he got a job at a winery in, um, Carlton, excuse me, <coughs> and um, and basically at that point he's like, I just want to do this full time. So um, I was working myself. I had a full time job, had the insurance, all of that, um, and it started literally with just uh, I think I need a license of some kind to make wine, and I said I I don't know. So he just started handing me paperwork, and so just I just had to kind of figure it out. I made a few phone calls and. You know, we just kind of cobbled our little business together because once you start making wine and you want to sell it, you have to be a business. It's not like you can sell it out of your basement. I mean, you can sell it out of your basement, but it's not something that we wanted to do. So um, that was my role, was just kind of the paper pusher. Mm -hmm. And then when we actually planted our first vineyard in Alsea, Oregon, which is on a friend's farm, then I was Barnaby's, I guess, assistant vineyard person. <laughs> The two of us planted a 2,000 um, plant vineyard. It was about 2,000 plants? Uh, yeah, a little north, but yeah. 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 And didn't really know what we were doing. And so we would drive every weekend to Elsie, which was about a two-hour drive. Oh, right. So we'd go down on Friday night, spend the night, leave Sunday evening after working the vineyard all weekend, and then go back to work on Monday. It wasn't even a cabin. It was like a lean-to mm -hmm. or a storage. You know, you'd be in your sleeping bag, and you'd hear mice and rats <laughs> scurrying around. There's bird shit all over inside there. Oh, my God. Cooking yes. a Coleman stove and listen to, you know, AM radio. It was actually nice. Come to think of it, yeah, it wasn't that bad. Yeah. In the moment, though, I had some complaints. <laughs> I'd spend like two hours cleaning the lean-to before we'd even move in. So there was just, 
you know, it's imagine it's amazing how many uh, little critters come in throughout the week and make it really dirty. <laughs> but anyway, enough of that. Um, yeah, so I, that's how I came into it, um, and I helped Barnaby in the winery when he was started to make wine commercially. But I was really juggling two jobs a lot, and it did get to the point I think twenty. 13 where I said um, you know I can't do both you know we're already starting to sell out of state we've got you know a lot more paperwork I have to get stuff ready for the sales team fill out POs invoices and I just was kind of dropping the ball on both ends because I was just working all the time so I said let's just make this leap of faith and I'll quit my job yeah I gotta say <laughs> so I was pouring wine in New York City at the time I was um God, I'm trying to remember where I was, but it was called the American Tasting. It's T. Edward, mm. our distributor. It was huge. And I'm like like Tom Cruising. I'm pouring like wine for everybody. My phone rings, and I'm like a first answer kind of guy. Like, I figure if there's a fire, you put it out when it's small. It's all going to say, hey, well, it's Barnaby. I'm, and I always answer like, this is Barnaby at a wine tasting, you know. And, and, and she goes, oh, I quit my job. <laughs> and I'm like... Are you shitting me? The, and like, hey, everybody, my wife just quit her job. All you, all you New York Psalms. And so that was. Um, I, yes, I remember making that phone call. That's the same time oh, you made a phone call to me saying, which credit card should I use? And I said, for what? <laughs> he goes, for the 2,000 vines I just ordered. Well, no, you got to dial back. So I, you, I, uh, if, when you're married, you can't hear each oh, other. Yeah, it's like it's like that. Tower of Babel. Like if she talks to me, it goes, and I talk to her, it goes. And so we were at this wine dinner where a friend of ours offered to let us plant her vineyard. And I told Olga, I said, Gisela says we can plant our vineyard. She didn't hear shit. I was like, okay, mm-hmm. continue <laughs> on with my conversation. So a couple days later, now you can now it's contextualized. Right, so he tells me I don't remember hearing it, or I heard something, but I just ignored it, of course. And um, yeah, and then the next day at work, he called me, he's like, okay, I'm here. What credit card should I use? And that's when I said, what are you talking about? They said, I'm ordering the 2,000 pines. I said, for what? And he goes, for the vineyard we're planting in Elsie. Remember? Next Gisela's weekend. It? Yeah, next <laughs> weekend. Clear your schedule. Um, so, yeah, that happened. And then that was a three-year project until we got our first harvest. Could you imagine if our government worked that efficiently? <laughs> You'd be driving down to, oh, wow, there's a new freeway and a new bridge. <laughs> or, you know, oh, look, there's a skyscraper. and That's where we're helping the homeless people. I mean, if business could operate without... Oh, we, we are business. We are, yeah. But that's why we're so poor. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it's just full of surprises, you know, and life is short and you just got to do it. It's been and I, so wonderful. Yeah, it really has. I think if we knew what, what it, everything that was entailed in starting a winery and making wine and growing a business, I don't think I would have done it. Mm. I would have been too scared and I would have said, there's no way we can do this mm. unless we're millionaires. And a lot of millionaires do that, but we were not. And then I would have wound up, walked up to you and said, or you can have a job where you do the same thing <laughs> every day till they squeeze you out because you're too old and, yes. and throw you away. There's that. And so we have a choice. So there's pros and cons to owning your own business. But I would say, you know, if I talk, if someone asked me, you know, I'm thinking about starting a winery, what do you think? I would be completely honest with them. And say, here are some things you need to consider. You work every single day. You don't know when your next check is going to come in the mail. And it's really scary. But it's also really exciting. And it's fun to drink a lot of wine. Well, a lot what of did, good wine. What did Churchill say? He said democracy is a terrible form of government or something, but it's better than everything else. <laughs> so, and there's just so many different kinds of wineries. It's not just one stereotype. And I would say that before I got into this, I thought wineries had enormous vineyards their wines were everywhere and you made a lot of money um what was your opinion well you didn't even drink wine i just wanted to make stuff i wasn't probably thinking so much about it um but i i wanted to do something different i think yeah i remember on our first date you said i'll let you pick out the wine and i said great how about this napa cab <laughs> there's nothing wrong with napa cabernets but it's what I selected, and he's like, oh, he looked so disappointed. And I said, what's wrong? And he's like, oh, well, I'm cool really getting into, like, Oregon Pinot Noirs. And I didn't really know what a Pinot Noir was. I thought it was just going to be some kind of light-bodied wine that I wouldn't like. So I think I won that time. That was a pretty yeah. amazing date. <laughs> and she was, all, she was still a vegetarian. And I, I so, totally support it. But, like, if you're around me, like, I, I just eat a lot of intense things. It was things. tough. Yeah. And I kind of went out the door. Is that when you stuck a, stole a bite of my steak yes. when I went to the bathroom? <laughs> I can't take it anymore. 
And then I learned to drink Oregon Pinot Noirs, and they were actually really good. Mm -hmm. So once you decided that this was something you wanted to pursue full time, you talk about kind of diving into it. Tell me about the process of, of learning to grow and learning to, and learning to make. And did you travel to do it? Did you get edu educated? How did that work? I, I think a lot of everything. And, I, and one of the things I should thank be, and I'm not just saying this because everybody has to make their, their gracious statements, but so many winemakers have been so generous and kind about sharing information and you know here i was this guy that knew nothing about it and some of the most famous winemakers in the world i would just walk up and ask a question and i always kind of thought you know if i went to the neighborhood we don't have it anymore but we used to have a neighborhood guitar store and got a guitar and called up eric clapton or, or you know or or tony Iommi sabbath i wouldn't be able to get a hold of them but you know i could get a hold of people like john paul from Cameron or Johannes Zelbach from Zelbach Oster and these people you know gave me the ability to change my life and I think that is something that's really remarkable to this industry and you know once in a while you know I'll be at the winery and, and the phone will ring and I'll pick it up and some guy will say oh yeah I bought this wine kit I'm in my basement and I'm trying to figure out what to do with the yeast and it makes me so happy it reminds me like Oh yeah, do you want me to come over? What do, what do you want? What do you want to do? Let's figure this out. Because everybody did the same thing for me, and they could have just laughed. So I mean, seriously, thanks to those people. And I wasn't afraid to ask. And I like to experiment. Um, and a, a big, I mean, the biggest prop I should give is to this man, Avald Mosler, who is a German. He's from the Mosel Valley. His name is Mosler, which means from the Mosel Valley. <laughs> And he was a big Riesling importer, actually still is. Mm -hmm. And when I became wine buyer at the restaurant, I needed some Riesling. And I called Avald, I said, hey, I need to see some wines. And he, he brought in 14 Rieslings and I bought every one. And that was a night I came home and told Olga, I'm gonna be, have to learn how to do this, I have to quit. And got to be super good friends with Avald. And he took me to Germany and introduced me to a family that's been a huge part of me learning to make Riesling. Uh, Carl Junglin, Anna Junglin, Weingut Ackermann, and Daniel Imish. Daniel Imish, exactly. Andreas Resch, and you know, you know, we always say Mosel Mafia. When you go to Celting <laughs> and we just know everybody. And so, you know, I was fortunate to have a, an Oregon perspective, but also an alternate perspective. And to this day, our production is probably at least two thirds white. And there's a joke. It doesn't matter what grape you get, Barnaby, if it's white, it winds up tasting a little bit like Riesling. So. Except if you bring Oregon Riesling to Germany and have them taste it, and they don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Well, they just drink. They don't like. It's us. We're so curious to try all these different wines. It's been part of their culture for two thousand years, and they know Avald's mom was banned from a wine tasting competition. What? This is true. I didn't know about yeah, that. Yeah, um, what was it? I'll remember her what name in a minute. <laughs> because she not only could tell what vineyard it was, she could taste the vintage and what part of the vineyard it was. And they had this re vineyard reorganization in 71 where they went from having like 100,000 vineyards in Germany and the government consolidated and they went to like 2,000 or something. So they used to have these older names, Martha, and she would know, oh, yeah, this is a 75, but it's, yeah, it's Deutsch Herrenberg, but it's from the old Grosser Mann plot. And, um, <laughs> but the thing is, they've never had Riesling, most of the villagers, that isn't grown in slate. So when you bring Rieslings that are grown in, you know, Jory or Belpine or even, you know, further up the valley in Luxembourg, which is only like 60 kilometers, where it's grown in chalk, it doesn't taste like Riesling because they are, they associate Riesling with a local terroir. You talk about, you talk about going there and, and being, being being inspired by Riesling. Uh, tell me about the. Did you learn anything in terms of technique there that you brought back? Uh, do you consider yourself like a Germanic yes. winemaker? Yes. Yes. Okay. So what is it? What is it about the what's so the unique about their technique? He, he, I I think that it's uh, technique and philosophy are sort of intertwined, and. My favorite Rieslings in the world are aged Rieslings. And so we'd have all these like late night beer drinking conversations. And we're like, and none of us are scientists. And even as some of these people 
you know, are technically Vinzers, like they went to wine school. We weren't certain about what we thought was old vines, dry farmed, good vineyard sites, fresh acidity, some residual sugar, um, uh, wood fermented, and wild yeast. And so I'm like, okay, like I'm just gonna steal their engineering. I'm like, right, well, okay, that's how I'm gonna make all my whites. It's a super minimal handling, you know. I am definitely, you know, I consider myself part of the natural movement, but I'm not like a rent-a-cop. I'm not gonna tell other people what to do. I think that there's way too much divisiveness right now. Um, the wine's good, it's good. But um, we try and buy fruit from older vineyards. All, our, all Teutonic wines are dry farmed, and I'm not telling people what to do. If you make great wine with irrigated fruit, I'll buy your wine gladly and drink it, but this is what I do. Um, and then we just press it off, we're very gentle. We press it off gently, we settle it, we go to barrel clean. I do what's called pied de couve, where I build a yeast starter individually from each vineyard because I feel biology is part of terroir. So we build these yeast starters and I'll you know, have like maybe 16 buckets of the house because I have to have a starter for all 16 vineyards. Um, and, and the nice thing about that too is a lot of times with wild fermentation, you get a lot of volatility or ethyl acetate, but you see, if I can feed them and get those wines up to, you know, 10% alcohol before I pitch them, usually all the bad yeast and biology is suppressed at that point. So when I have site-specific biology and it's clean, and I sent some of the, um, some of the Pete de Couve to uh, ETS for the DNA testing to see what it actually was, and three of the, three of the four were not known. So that kind of was like, okay, all you dudes, all you haters, proof in the pudding. And what else is interesting too is that um, in Germany, traditionally they would use commercial yeast. And Barnaby started introducing his thoughts on natural yeast and not that many winemakers were hip to it. But then the Ackermann started because you asked them to make some wine for us. And, they, then, they have. and now they're starting to a little bit more. Well, I would say just the, the ten trend since we've been over there in terroir, um, they've gone back to wild ferments. Um, but historically, up until like the 70s, I think everything was wild and neutral oak. And then people started doing fiberglass, cement tanks, stainless. But my experience is most of the people have reverted back to neutral oak. Mm -hmm. Or most you of the- to the, natural yeast, not neutral oak. To neutral oak. And, oh, I, thought and I don't think I don't think Ackerman is actually still mostly. I think they're still mostly cultured yeast, mostly. Yeah, except when they made that one for us. Though. Absolutely. That was, yeah, yeah, and they said they were worried about it. Tell them about that. That was kind of a cool project. Yeah, we um, we took over a vineyard for a couple of years, planted in 1955, cool. in the heart of a, it's a Schlossberg vineyard, which is Castle Mountain and Seltingen, and and uh, well, obviously Harald was making the wine for us, but we were like. Basically, dry, off dry, wild ferment, super old vines, minimal handling. Um, it's called Term. And Term was the old way. Germans are bizarrely obsessed with like fairness and equity. So, you know, when we think of vineyards here, you own your vineyard and there's like a fence, a deer fence around it. In Germany, a vineyard is like a neighborhood and there might be a hundred families that own rows in the vineyards. So, if, say we're in Schlossberg and this is my row and this is where my neighbor's vineyard starts the old-fashioned way was called term like terminus boundary so there would actually be a transition row so if this is that's my my vineyard 100 percent. that's my neighbors this would be our transition row every other plant would be mine every other <laughs> plant would be my neighbors oh that's so because then if your spray program's different you've got this buffer but it's terribly problematic because when i would work in the vineyard and they were all you know head pruned i'd be like working on my plants and I just get into my headphones and I'm jamming and then like, oh crap, I just, I just worked 18 of my neighbor's vines because <laughs> I can't remember to skip a plant. It's an awesome project. I love it. That's yeah, Tim. And that gentleman was too old to take care of that vineyard. And, you know, back in the day, every plot of land was used for vineyards and it went all the way to the very top. And over the years, a lot of the Germans, their kids, grow up and they don't really want to become winemakers and they want to work in tech and so all the vineyards are shrinking mm -hmm. it's really sad even over just a few years yeah. that we visited we'd look and we'd see all these abandoned vineyards and then i think the government even rips them out 
pretty yeah. soon. Well, it's, it's, it's expensive really to work a vineyard this deep mm -hmm. when the public in the Mosul Valley will only pay six euro a bottle. And this is like, like a Grand Cru kick-ass vineyard that should be like $100 a bottle. And, you know, you're 80 years old and you're working on this. You kind of just say, well, I can't do that. So talking about your, your vineyard here, you mentioned the, the starting one and also tell me about the, the, the decisions to what we were going to plant and you talk about kind of a three-year project. Tell me about the process of, of getting your own vineyard up and running. Well, that, that was definitely, I asked a lot of questions, but there was also a lot of, like Olga said, we don't really know what we're doing. <laughs> I, I made the decision, when I was talking to the woman, it was actually west of the coast range, and I think, I said, I said well, Gisela, can you ripen tomatoes? And she's like, yeah, most years. I'm like, all right, that, we'll give it a go. But I would say economically, it is probably not the most viable place to plant grapes. We, you know, we're finally getting, and by the way, it's changed. It's still run for us, but we're not doing it ourselves anymore. We finally have broke the 110 per acre, but for about a decade, we're getting about a quarter to half a ton an acre, and it was picked. We'd pick it in like anywhere from like Halloween to mid-November and you know at 19 bricks but the wines are really gorgeous super racy mineral driven um, definitely kind of a ringer for Alsace and maybe as if climate change continues it might be more viable it, it's it's it, it's really different you know a lot because there's so much precipitation the soils are really nu nutrient depleted um, you get probably 100 inches of rain mostly from mid-October through May, mm -hmm. so it, it and then it actually has less precipitation in the summer than the valley, and a lot of winds. So even with all that water, you get water, you get water stress. And then we have another site that's even maybe even crazier. It's near Wilsonville, and it's on an old abandoned gravel quarry. It's all people ask me what type of soil it is like. Will it be jory, except for it's on a mountain? And it's all rock. And I wanted to plant a garden there, and you know, it'll look like there's grass, but as soon as you take a shovel, it's like chink, chink, clink, clink. And I, then I started trying to break it up with a pickaxe and bring in mulch, I just couldn't do it. And it's, parts of it are pretty steep. It's definitely, it is really a mineral bomb. You can taste the basalt. Mm -hmm. And it used to be at the bottom of the vineyard, there's a fence, and we'd always stand around the fence and joke, and it was like this, and we said, oh, we should plant this. And, and it was kind of a joke. And then the Jungman family from Fine Good Ackerman were over here. He's like, Bonnaby, just make it. This is no big deal. So we planted it. And I broke an auger planting it. We had to, we had to plant it with a jackhammer. And it was really, really, it was really, really rough hard. getting those hard. in there. And we built a fence at the bottom because it ends in a sheer cliff. I've fallen into that fence at least 20 times. That fence has saved my life 20 <laughs> times. Um, but the Riesling's so good, it's crazy. That, you know, the first year we made Riesling off it was 16. And if I pour it, it tastes like Mosul wine, like the, mm -hmm. like 80 year old vines, it's, it's crazy. And the plants are super happy too, it's, which is just puzzling because there's nothing, there's just, just rock. Uh, in addition to the, your own vineyards, obviously, you so mentioned you source from a lot of other places. Tell me what you're looking for in, in when it comes to, you mentioned dry farming. What else are you looking for when it comes to grapes? Cold sites. Cold, cold sites. Old, cold, high, dry, wooden, wild. That's what we say. Old vines, cold sites, high sites, dry farmed. And we use wood and wild yeast. So the first vineyard we start working with is Crow Valley Vineyard, which is southwest of Eugene near King Estate. Um, very, very cold site. You know, things have warmed up, but the first few years we worked with them, sometimes like the Gewurz would just fail mm -hmm. but when it doesn't fail it's got for Gewurz just awesome ripping acid lots of lots of mineral in fact I kind of think it's the best Gewurz I don't know <laughs> I like it a lot it's a really cool vineyard site and you know and I think things have shifted you know when I first got into this you know one of the vineyards I work with is this really high elevation site and and I was talking to the guy who's now a really good friend of ours and I said hey you've got one of the highest vineyards in the valley and he's and he's like yeah because back then people really were looking for bigger pinots and I was like 
He's like, well, what are you are you looking? And I hadn't bought fruit from him. He didn't know who I was. You know, this is like a long time ago. And he's like, yeah, he goes, you'd make it sparkling or rosé. I said, no, man, I want to make the lightest, most elegant Pinot. And he's like, I don't care what you do, but just pay me, please. <laughs> Because that was such a weird idea in 2009, the idea of trying to make the lightest Pinot. Mm -hmm. And there was some pushback with winemakers that were sharing the same facility with Burnaby. <laughs> <laughs> and when they tasted his wine, they're like, ooh, you got to throw some oak chips mm. and throw a little sugar in there. And will you tell us? People story? just, the, a lot of people in the wine business honestly believed that these kind of new style of wines wouldn't sell. And they weren't being jerks. They're like, you know, we like this, but the distributors won't buy it. The wine buyers won't like it, buy it. And wine spectator, you know, the whole point system, mm -hmm. everything was big, fruity, fruit bombs. That's what people wanted. And they thought that's what Pinot should be like. Mm -hmm. And there's so much Pinot that was sort of bastardized. Yeah, Oregon, the, the, it, you will always have a lot of fruit in the Willamette Valley. You don't, in my opinion, need to exaggerate it or stretch it. If anything, you know, like my style is about I don't want the fruit to be too excessive because I think if the fruit is too opulent you can't taste the mineral or the terroir but the world has changed I mean there's definitely we love the big wines too there's but the thing is the diversity the spectrum has really opened up and I think that it's the, the world now is very encouraging of creativity fresh ideas and we've grown the pie like you know you have the Archery Summit, the Vines Serenes, and all these bigger, more luxury-driven wines. And then, but now you also have weirdo wines. And that's that's how we that's how we eke out our living, is we make weirdo wines. I think if we started 10 years earlier, we would not be where we are today. I mean, it, the timing was so perfect. You know, the pendulum started swinging the other way. Barnaby stuck to his guns. He didn't. I remember him asking me, well, this is what the other guys are saying. What should I do? Should we, should I manipulate the wine? And I, I didn't really know what to say. But in my mind, I was thinking, well, I guess we should be making what, that, what other people are making. I just thought it would be too scary to try to sell something that wasn't really, uh, you know, there was no other wines like that. But you kind of stuck well, it out. and. You know, if I have a life school advice to anybody, and it's not just winemaking. Yep. You know, don't do this at everything you do, but when something really matters to you, do it the way you honestly believe. And if you fail, you will look back on your life and say, I stuck to my guns, I did what I believed, and now I'm doing something else. But for me, you know, there's a lot, I saw most of my life I've compromised or, you know, deferred the challenge, but I kind of said, you know what, I can go back to working the wrecking yard or I can do this. But I want to make wines that I want to drink and wines that I feel happy when I'm making them. So we, we, we mm -hmm. powered through. Yeah. It was a hard year that first time when we were selling wine. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what we were doing. But when I'm sitting in a hole here, I used to have a little pond here. <laughs> and I just I didn't fill it in a long time oh, ago. That's hilarious. <laughs> so I'm sitting in the pond. I'm, I'm curious about that, about the selling wine and the timing of that. You mentioned kind of where we are now versus where we were maybe a decade ago in terms of weirdo wines. But when you started, you're not really sure how to sell wine. You're not really sure if there is a if there is a customer base out there. So tell me about finding people who wanted your wine. So can I take this? I'm going to sure, yeah. let you finish. So, so <laughs> we were terrified and we kind of thought we might fail. But we had gone through, we had this product and we were really, really intimidated to sell it. And we were so uncertain. And it was Alcy and we took turns trying to go out in the market, and Olga went out one day. I think that was the first one, yeah. Now this is where I want you to take over. <laughs> um, so I took a day off because I was working full time. So I like would schedule holiday, you know, vacation days and go out and sell wine on those days. And I did go to the, a wine shop. I don't want to mention who it is. They're a very well known wine shop, and they sell great wine. But I just didn't really know what to do or what to say. And Barnaby's like, well, you just pour the wine and let them taste it. And, you know, and I poured the wine and the guy took the glass and he put it aside and he goes, thank you. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, okay, I guess bye. Um, I don't even think we had business cards at that point. So I got in the car and I called Barnaby. He's like, how did it go? I'm like, I don't know. He's like, what do you mean you don't know? What did he say when he tasted the wine? I said, he didn't. He said, oh, okay, well, why did he not taste the wine? I said, I don't know. It was The guy just wasn't tasting wine anymore. I didn't know that, and there was someone else that tasted it later. But it was just this weird thing. We didn't know who these people are. They were like, who are you? You know, what is this wine about? And 
it was just kind of a mess, you know. I mean, I just felt so vulnerable because I, I had no experience doing this. I really didn't know much about the wine industry, the protocol, the verbiage. But later that day. Oh, the vindication. Right. Yes, thank you. Oh, the good part. That's yeah. right. So there was a new restaurant opening up in Portland, in downtown Portland, and it was an alpine cuisine, alpine-focused cuisine. It was called Gruner at the time. It was a big deal. It was Chris Israel's new spot. Yep. And it was going to be hot. And we were fantasizing, we, we could get into that place. Said, Our wines are perfect. And it was a Pinot Meunier. Um, so I poured the Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier for this gentleman who didn't taste the wine. And apparently, uh, the woman who does taste the wine, she was really impressed. And she called her friend Dana Frank, who now owns Bar Norman. And Dana said, I need to try, try this wine. And so she handed told Dana how to get in touch with us. And so later that day, we got an email from her saying, we'd love to taste your wines. We're opening up Gruner. So it was wow. just like, oh, how did that happen? <laughs> yeah, and suddenly, like, like they bought cases. And the wine shop bought cases. Yeah. And suddenly, like, we were out of product. And I can tell you, it's like thinking you have cancer and finding out you don't. Like, when we realized that people wanted to drink these wines, we're like, oh, wow, this is going to work. It was, it was good. It was good. Yeah. We were selling wine. It wasn't quite that. I mean, we had to struggle, too. I mean, it wasn't. We struggled, like we but the wine sold. Though. The wines. We I only mean, made five barrels. So, it, right? They sold. They did sell. Yeah. And people came back for more. Yes. Yes. I think the Gruner thing was really a great experience for us. And, um, yeah, you know, it's so, it's so long ago, it's hard for me to remember <laughs> the remember. details. What about when you started hearing from customers directly? What, what was the response to the wines that maybe they never had before or styles they never had before? Huh. Well, I, I think that we initially were, you know, we have... Pinot Noir, light Pinot Noir, in the Alsace bottle. So you get a lot of questions. Why are you in a Riesling bottle? And why is this? Yes. But immediately, Psalms and Wine Geeks. We basically, for the first three, four years, we probably almost exclusively sold to the wine community itself. And, you know, you'd get calls from people like, oh, yeah, that was one of our harvest wines. I want to buy some. I think with climate change and the warmer vintages, we became more accessible to mainstream. And I would say that depending on the wine, I think people who are new to wine that don't have any preconceived ideas really like our wine, and then people that have been drinking wine for a long time or like European wines mm -hmm. like our wine. So as you were starting the brand, tell me about the, the meaning behind Teutonic, why you went with the name and, and kind of what you, as you started to develop your brand and your space, what you wanted it to, to be. Well, Teutonic is, I like words, and um, <laughs> it's just it's just an old fashioned way of saying Germanic. And I, I like it because it kind of sounds tough, but most people don't know what it means. So they ask and I say, oh yeah, it's just, you know, Germany, like in Spanish, it's called Alemania. They call it Deutschland and all these different words. and. You know, in England, like Shakespearean times, they'd say, oh, the Teutonic languages, Teutonic cuisines, because Germany wasn't a unified country, and you have Switzerland and Austria. And um, so anyway, yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. And, um, and it rhymes with chronic, so. Oh, my God. That, <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah, our rosé, people would thought it's more like cannabis, and so they started saying Teutonic's the chronic. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember, where was this? Uh, it was at a tasting and some girl came up yeah, and said, like Teutonic the, is the chronic. And we're like, what? Yeah, and then us, these other girls were there when this gal said it. She goes, really? And I said, she, she, yeah, you didn't know? I said, we're like the official wine of the hip-hop community now. <laughs> and I guess there was some song when there was that whole thing about Cristal and the boycott. And they said, oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't drink Cristal because I'm down with the chronic. And these gals thought that was about Teutonic. <laughs> and I said, I said, yeah, I was with them when they wrote that. You didn't know? They were so gullible. It was, I'm it was sorry, funny. it was fun. It's a great way to sell wine, though. Yeah, I mean, for sure. You know, if you... And maybe it is. Maybe that, maybe that. I think it's this fellow named Little Bow Wow. So maybe he does drink Teutonic. I don't know. It could be. If he doesn't now, maybe he will. Yeah. yeah. After, after seeing this. Yeah, yeah Little Bow Wow, reach out. I'll hook you up. <laughs> so I'm curious. You have obviously a lot of other interests outside of wine. You talked a little bit about your, your past before wine. Tell me about how other things you're interested in kind of fit into the Teutonic. Your, your place and 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 what you're what you're kind of hoping for as a 
to, to, to show up to your clients, I guess, for lack of a better word? Like, what do you want people to get out of, of visiting Teutonic or knowing you two? Well, they're not that, there weren't any urban wineries when we first started, except I think maybe Hip Chicks or something. But um, it just really, I feel like the urban winery scene is so much more us. I'll be totally honest, we couldn't afford to buy a vineyard out in wine country and plant a vineyard and build our in a state. So this kind of worked for us, but it's really who we are. And if you come to our winery, it doesn't feel like a winery that you normally go to. I mean, it kind of feels like a bar, like a roadhouse bar. We've got stickers on the mirror and lots of posters, like a poster of Red Fang. <laughs> I don't know. We're just kind of who we yeah. are here at home, and we wanted the place to be like reflective of what our personalities are like. And I, and I think, too, people have this ability to compartmentalize things. And I see everything as being interconnected. Everything is affecting everything else. And it's like, this isn't just about the wine. It's about people. It's about community. Um, you know, we play a lot of different music. We have a pretty good sound system. And, you know, we love metal and punk. But we also play a lot of jazz. And we've kind of dove in. We've been doing a lot of jazz shows before the world ended. And, um, and you know, we had a couple jazz guys over uh, last week. And we were hanging outside drinking and eating. And, you know, and this guy, Alan Jones, uh, local jazz drummer he's like telling the other guy like you know there is no separation you know you know working with the grapes working with the wines is very mu a very musical experience and you and it, you know the wine and the working with the grapes can affect the music and the music can affect it and i really do i really do think that you know there's there's a lot of truth to this and it's easy for our minds to break things down into data points but really like us sitting here this is this is uh, like a, a, a stew of all these different things. It's not you can't separate the the environment from us or the content of the wine or the fact that everything that compelled us to make wine is in the world that's around you right now. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. That makes so. <laughs> it does absolutely. So you started small, five barrels. Tell me about tell me about the growth since then and and, and what you've been kind of striving for. Don't leave out 2010 and 2011 and how hard that was. I, I think that, you know, we would start working with vineyards and getting a little bit of fruit. And every year we wound up getting more and more fruit until certain vineyards we work with were getting all the fruit. And like I said, 10 and 11 were very difficult. And I think it was a real blessing to have challenging vintages like that early on. But conversely, 2014 was a challenging vintage too because I'd never experienced a vintage that hot. Mm -hmm. And we had, but that time that was, 08 was our first vintage. So that was like vintage five, I guess, or six. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, this is going to ruin my brand because even with these cold vineyards, I'm going to make lush, opulent wines. And I thought, well, maybe I'll add water or I don't know what to do about this. And ultimately we didn't. But we also went from like 2,800 cases to about 6,000 because all these vineyards had excess fruit. And, and I think in economics, I could tell those people, sorry, I'm not going to pick up the fruit. But I think there's a relationship. And I think that ethically, I need to do everything I can to support our growers. And if they have a lot of fruit... It's nature's way, just like what's the sugar, what's the acid, what's what do the what does the grapes taste like? Also, part of the vintage variation is how much damn fruit is there, mm -hmm. and that's also. We a were getting thing. calls from growers just saying, "Please, just take it. I won't even charge you for it." And we couldn't. We didn't have enough barrels. There was a barrel shortage, so I was calling California and buying barrels from them, and they were carting it up just so we had enough vessels to put the the juice in. And yeah, so 2014 was a tough year in that sense. We sold a lot of wine in mm. 2015. I will say that I do feel like a, a weird ethical thing that if you have contracts or agreements to buy fruit and you know you plan ahead and then there's certain people that wait and like, okay, here's a vineyard that's got a crisis. They'll give me the fruit if I pick it myself or they'll sell it for 500 a ton. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's capitalism, but is that ethical? Like the people that plan ahead and really take care of the people they do business with, mm. as opposed to the people that like, oh, you know, I've got cancer 
and I'm selling my house for fifty thousand dollars because it's an emergency. What kind of person are you to do that? You know, I think that, or yeah, I'll give you a deal on the fruit, but but next year I'll buy it for full price. Thank you for helping me get my business started. I think there needs to be some sort of reciprocation, as opposed to always waiting for desperation it's every so harvest. Hard. Growers are that's like yeah. the hardest job. I mean, and they're the ones that are responsible for the fruit. So if we don't get good fruit, we can't make good wine. And they're always the last to get paid, and they're always the one that have to deal with all the horrible weather. And, you know, and then with the immigration thing, I mean, that is really tough. I mean, we have one vineyard that we manage now. It's doable. It's like two acres, maybe a little more than that. No, a little just shy, but like yeah. close to two. But, I mean, think of all the people that are managing like acres and acres and acres of fruit. Mm -hmm. It's tough. It's backbreaking work. And if the fruit's bad and you don't have a contract, the wine makers can turn it away, right? I mean, that we got fruit one year from a vineyard because it, the bricks weren't high enough, and they didn't want to make wine with it, so we bought it. Yeah, that was just sort of a one-off. But you know, that's what Barnaby was saying is that we have relationships with vineyards, and we buy everything that we say we're going to buy. So if the if they're they produce a short amount, that we oh still well, pay two thousand. We still pay the same, fruit. and if they produce too much, we still pay the same per ton. And so. it's, never, it's never been an issue. And I think that, you know, everything resolves itself. If this is what nature gave. This is how people made wine for thousands of years. And I understand if you have a brand where you make a lot of bottles or people buy it ahead of time and they have a certain expectation. With our vineyards, us Pinot, some years it'll be Pinot. Some years it'll be white. Some years it'll be sparkling. Some years it'll be rosé. And people expect that from us. So we kind of like okay, this is what we get, you know, what are we going to make with what we get? Mm -hmm. And I, I also like that challenge. I'm curious about developing that kind of, of skill set to, to where you can challenge yourself each year to come up with the best solution. So at what point do you start feeling, did you start feeling the confidence to take whatever fruit you were given and make an interesting product out of it? Well, probably that confidence probably just came from blind stupidity. You know, you just <laughs> do things. Well, um, 2011 was your first sparkling oh no it wasn't no it was the Riesling yeah well in I think 2011 this Pinot Noir at the Wallstrom site which is actually a, one of our warmer sites mm -hmm. it's where all the the rock the the Pinot the bricks just I thought you know if I either I could capitalize it or I'll make sparkling so that was um a rosé brute that we made we did a barrel fermented then three-year tirage and it was pretty delicious and then 12, it was red wine. 13, there was a lot of yellow jacket damage for whatever reason. So because the skins were torn up, I thought I could use a lot of sulfide or I could just make, I was hoping to make a white wine, but it kind of picked up a little color and um, it was delicious. So, um, I mean, honestly, I, I think I have like a good kind of mechanical, some sort of good intuition um, you know, weird left brain, right brain thing. You know, I grew up gardening with my grandparents since I was a little kid, and I just loved growing things and tinkering and, you know, building old, like both those cars in my driveway were kind of, you know, started as garbage, and here we are, and it's, it's just an intuition thing. So obviously you're, you're kind of known for pu pushing some of the boundaries of winemaking and grape growing. Uh, tell me about what sets you guys apart? We talked a little bit about it already, but what sets you apart, and what you hope customers will get out of a bottle of your wine? What do you? What is the reaction you're going for? What is the? What is the? What, what keeps people coming back? Well, I think we we don't want customers to feel too intimidated by wine in general. So if they come in, sometimes they'll say, you know, I really don't know anything about wine, almost apologetically, and we're like, great, you don't have to know anything about wine, just. If you like it, tell us, and we'll find the right wines for you. And um, we just are really, like, we drop all that language, you know, the whole wine talk, wine speak. We make people feel comfortable. And we've converted, I would say, a lot of people yeah. into drinking Riesling. Because mm -hmm. that's the first thing that, oh, I don't drink Riesling. <laughs> it's yeah. too sweet. And so here we go. We have to go through that whole you know, let me explain to you about Riesling and sweetness in wines. And once we kind of go through that and then they taste it, 
they actually end up liking the sweeter Rieslings overall. We found that in general. And I've had a lot of time in grocery stores where we used to sell our wines and do like in-store tastings. And, I'll, you know, and this is really blind because these are people shopping. And so I'm like, excuse me, would you like to try some wine? And sometimes they're more than happy to. Other times, you know, you kind of get the no thanks. Um, and we did a lot of Riesling. And um, again, I went through that same whole process of explaining and it's okay, you don't have to like it, just try it. And I would say almost a third of the time, the person will buy the sweeter Riesling yeah. and say, oh, I never knew. Um, <laughs> so we want people to just feel comfortable, enjoy our wines and to come back and keep buying it. You know, yeah. join our wine club. And also to what Olga's saying, I don't like the knowledge fetish. I mean, yes, if you care about wine, you want to learn these things. But if you want to buy a Toyota Camry, the person selling you the car is not going to make you feel like a chump because you don't know the compression ratio or the torque specs in the cylinder head. They want you to drive that car. They're going to act like your best friend and hopefully you like the way it drives. And I, I think that it's true about wine. And I tell people, like, look at me. I'm a regular, I'm a knucklehead. I drive muscle cars, listen to bizarre music in I'm nobody. I'm just a guy that does this. I enjoy it. Don't be intimidated. You know, anybody that treats you like crap because you don't know these words, give them the finger and come see me and I'll be really nice to you. So that, and, and then ultimately, I want to give people pleasure. People work really hard for their money. I want to give good value, make a rock solid project. And then just like all of us, you know, we've all got our secret philosophies and all that. And I want to engage people. I want to bring people to a table start conversations like looking in the mirror at yourself look in the mirror at me you know the meaning of life what is all this what is this all really about you know when you when you smoke a joint and put on some john coltrane and you're feeling that good vibe that's how i want my wine to be and we got to say our wines are really food friendly as well yeah the higher acid breaks through a lot of the fat and spice so um you know folks always ask what should i pair this wine with so we kind of throw out you know, spicy Asian food goes great with our Gewürz demeanor and Rieslings. Butcher block wines is one of our hashtags. Um, so any kind of charcuterie, I think, goes really nicely with our off-dry wines. And our red wines yeah. are not super full-bodied, so you can drink our red wines when you eat salmon. I almost, uh, well, to Olga, I said butcher block wines. I really feel our white wines actually pair better with wild game and charcuterie and fatty foods in our red in some ways. Mm -hmm. You know, a little RS and ripping acidity is just a really good fat scrubber, you know. And and it's another thing too is I kind of like the natural wine movement. I, I feel that we're sort of the scientific wing that just because we don't do a lot doesn't mean that I reject the fact that science is what makes this happen. Mm -hmm. But it's just like, the smell of a flower that you can't recreate in a laboratory is not magic. It's just science that we haven't mastered yet. And, you know, keep thinking, keep questioning. Don't reject science. Keep Vaccinate clean, your kids. Wear masks. Clean. Science is real. You're a clean winemaker. Yeah, That's sanitation. too, yeah. So a specific example I want to ask about, your, your candied mushroom recently. Tell me about that. How, <laughs> how, how did we get to a candied mushroom Riesling? And, and, uh, and Why is it called a candied I mean, mushroom? Why is it called that? <laughs> Honestly, you know, um, this fruit came in, Riesling from Crow Valley, always comes in very late, and it looked like little gerbils or guinea pigs. It was furry with fungus. And I will admit, at that time, you know, like... I, you know, I, I, like I don't want to sound like a, a druggie or anything, so I'm not. I haven't, I haven't smoked pot at all since COVID because I'm taking care of my lungs. I don't eat because I think that's terrifying. Um, but I've been smoking lots of weed, and I was listening to a lot of the most far out jazz, trying to take my mind to like a place. You know, it's like the '60s, and you're trying to like learn. I was probably because I'm too chicken shit to do acid, so I'm smoking a lot of weed and listening to crazy jazz and just trying to like have a fresh perspective on things. And this reasoning comes in. And there's like a bunch of bins and it is like it's hairy <laughs> and so and i was thinking about david chang at momofuku making his own sort of designer msg by re-fermenting mushrooms fungus on fungus and i thought hmm i wonder if i can make umami or msg out of riesling and got in the bin started jumping around the spores looked like dry ice there were clouds coming down the parking lot 
and I matched it all up, gave it four days with the fungus and the fruit and the skins macerating. Pressed it, um, settled it, went to barrel, inoculated with a pied de coup. So fungus one was the botrytis. Fungus two was the wild yeast and how many different types of wild yeast we don't know. <laughs> Typically I don't do batonage, but I really wanted to extract as much of those fungal enzymes. And so I was doing a lot of batonage. And then the Wallstrom Pinot always gets a little bit of film yeast. So I took film yeast from Wallstrom and inoculated it because I wanted to have just as many fungal enzymes. And if you have any hookups, I would love to get a bottle of that labbed and see what kind of fungal enzymes and what's going on in it. But when we bottled it, the most shocking thing is I expected it to taste like a, a basement. It's actually super clean and it's just, it, it's basically dry and it's so complex and that salty finish, that's not salt, that's natural MSG. And I should also say all this fear of MSG, I don't know, do y'all know the story about MSG? It's not true. The government, when they're putting the Japanese people in internment camps, wanted to create fear and mistrust. So they wanted people to be afraid of Asian restaurants. There is no scientific. MSG is in so many foods, Parmesan cheese. If you slow roast meats or vegetables, you're making MSG yourself. All fermentation, so all wines, just the process of fermentation itself, makes a certain amount of MSG. And while we're on the subject, by the way, that candy mushroom is my favorite wine I've ever made. I love having a crazy idea like this and the results exceed my expectation. But one of the other things I like to talk about, and sometimes you just talk about things. I think I know what you're going to say. Because people <laughs> need to be engaged. And sometimes, to, you know, when people hear wine talk all the time, you know, it just becomes background music, it becomes wallpaper. So, you know, I'll be in Oklahoma talking to a bunch of 80 year olds and I'll say, hey, how many of y'all smoke weed? And of course, they're like, look at me like I'm from Mars. And I said, well, guess what? You know, in that Riesling you're drinking, there's a lot of terpenes. And where I come from, it's legal. And we have labs that analyze the terpene content and the, you know, the aromatic qualities. And I thought, well, I keep telling people this. I'm going to find out. So I took a couple bottles. I took a Muscat and my Riesling to the lab that tests for terpenes. And the guy's like, dude, we don't <laughs> test wine here. I think of, well, I don't even know what to do. And I said, trust me, there's terpenes in this. A week later, I get this call. He sounds like he's having an asthma attack. He's, dude, 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 dude. I test the results. It's like the same profile as lemon sour diesel. What this guy could but terpenes are in so many things. See, terpenes are in citrus. Many, many foods we have terpenes. There's nothing psychoactive about it. But I do suspect my intuition that we're going to find in the future that there's like micronutrients. I bet a lot of these terpenes have, you know, slight incremental like an antioxidant or anti-cancer or therapeutic properties. I don't know. But yeah, that was cool. What I thought you were going to bring up, and I think this oh, is a good... Please. About sulfites. And how people go crazy oh, thinking yeah. that sulfites are so bad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they start marketing this is sulfite free, mm -hmm. which is not true. And there's sulfites in so many things that people eat, and yet they won't buy a bottle of wine thinking there's too many sulfites in there. I mean, an apricot, dried apricot, has more sulfites. And sulfites preserve the wine. And it makes it Shaking taste better. I, I'm a huge yeah. advocate. I'm not an advocate of heavy handed sulfite, but. There are wine writers, no names mentioned, that will only write reviews on low sulfite wines. And they say, oh, because I can taste. Except for these wine writers ask me what my sulfite levels are before they review my wines because they don't want to destroy their own ideology. We're relatively low for what we do, but I've had wines that we, one wine is the reason we do, which is a little bit of a project, it's called 1908. And it's the old way of making wine at the Mosul before, you know, the 19 teens, that they didn't have the filtration or the technology to make like cabinets mm -hmm. with RS because they would just go off and bottle. You know, wines like the Alsaces or Baron Alsaces, there's enough sugar to actually prevent fermentation, further fermentation. So all the cabinets back, you know, before the 1920s were dry, but because it was a much cooler climate and they cropped heavier, 
it would take sometimes years for these wines to be approachable. So they'd make them like Chablis. They'd be in barrel. They'd, be, they'd go through ML if they could get it to go through ML and do batonnage sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to recreate this. I wanted to know how it tasted. So we did this wine called 1908. And it was in barrel for about two years. And we'd take it out of barrel. And we'd take it to tank. And I'd taste it. I'm like, this is blah. This is so soulless. And then once again, my intuition kicked in. Kicked it at the 15 parts per million, free. And it was electric. It was vibrant. The fruit was back. And a lot of times, I think without sulfite, wines can taste muddled and dull. And, and turn brown. Yes. Don't use too much, but, but use and enough. It, and it dissipates over time. So if you want an aged wine, you need to have sulfites to preserve it. And do people realize, you know, when you're drinking wine that's produced in another country, this wine has to get put on a truck to go to a container, it goes over the ocean to another container, to another container, to another container, to another van that drives them the bottles finally to the wine shop. I mean, it needs to be or protected. you go to your natural food store and you buy some granola with dried apricots, there's more sulfite in one bowl of that granola than there is in a case of heavy-handed wine. It's just not, it's not science. It's not science. And, you know, and I think the natural wine movement is such a good thing, but I think there's a psychological reason that it's a reaction against science. And as soon as, you know, you know, we reject science and it becomes a witch hunt and this is that, there's markets I go to now where if the wine isn't muddy and it doesn't smell like a horse blanket, it's not good. Now, which Kurt Vonnegut novel is, is it where the wine, if it tastes good, it's not good because you can't make wine that tastes good naturally? So, you, you know, yes. And, and, and I have this another hashtag, natty, not nasty. Mm -hmm. So many of my friends are making wine with wild yeast and are very clean winemakers, and people don't know it. But the movement has passed them by because it's become so extreme, people forget that, you know, that these are natural wines and they don't taste like shit, you know? I'm sorry I said it. You know, I'm not saying whose wines I'm saying that, but there's so many, the vast majority of my friends right now are making natural, holistic wines, yet nobody realizes it because they taste, they don't taste like VA, reduction, or Brett. We were invited to a natural wine fest, and they, and they said, but you have to make sure that you have X amount or less of sulfites in your wine and I asked Barnaby I'm like what are the sulfites in our wine and I think you gave me a number that was higher so I just said I'm really sorry I guess we can't attend do you remember yeah, that I do and that well, was, do you remember what the parts per million were? I think that it was like impossibly low it was like five parts or something I'm curious how as you've grown and as you have made a name for yourself how uh, the, the customer uh, questions have changed. Uh, you, you have more customers come in demanding or asking for things that you aren't doing like that? I mean, are they, are they coming in asking for sulfide-free wine? Are they coming in asking for, uh, or are they coming in and kind of into your world accepting the wines that you're making? Uh, how, how have they changed in the decades? I think it, that we get less because I think people that come to us now have heard about us, they know what we are, mm -hmm. and they come to us expecting us. I think in the early days when we used to do a lot of supermarket tastings, I'd be like, I mean, the most common thing is, what's the biggest red you got? Yeah. That's the biggest thing, more than anything else. What's the biggest red you got? Any? Uh, yeah, I, I guess that's kind of the one thing, or I like dry wines, or, so in our wine, we don't make a lot of super, super dry wines, but we have a few, so I'll start there, and then again, they'll try the off dry wines, and they'll like them better. Yeah. <laughs> Or like, um, or do do they want our Pinot Meunier? We never have oh, it. Yeah, it's always sold out. <laughs> Got to figure out how to get more. We should. We need to find some more. Well, not us. Somebody oh, else. so we have a wine this year that we're gonna be releasing pretty soon that has these grapes mm -hmm. from my front and backyard, which is strange because it's Chardonnay, Syrah. There's a couple Pinot and a couple um, Pinot Noir and a couple of Pinot Meunier plants. And my friend Alan Jones has some yard Pinot Noir from uh, West Slope. And then we put, dumped it all together, this whole cluster of Pinot we did. And it's, um, it's pretty, it's, 
It, the thing is, I'll tell you what it is. It's probably like one tenth of one percent that Syrah, which is super underripe, which gave it this really kind of pyrazine green grassy thing that just cuts through perfectly. It's like a little spice on the steak. It's like. <laughs> Awesome. That'll be available probably in a couple months. Yeah, yeah. And bottle it. Do you uh, at this point do you feel any kind of like pressure to keep kind of pushing the envelope to blow people's minds each time each year, or is it just kind of it like it comes naturally <laughs> to him? <laughs> well, I just think things happen. Like you don't think about it, and things come out of the, the you know, like last year I got some Viognier. How does Viognier have anything to do with being too tall? Um, we got this Viognier, and I was like, oh man, I want to do this because. I, I kind of did a little bit of Viognier like some years ago with my buddy Jesse and from uh, Post Piste and Tom Monroe. We did a, it's called Tripod Project where we make wines all separately and dump it together and sell it. Um, but so I got this Viognier, I was like, oh, how the Dickens is this Teutonic? And then it occurred to me that um, in Switzerland they grow Viognier. So I'm like, okay, they're bent boom, it's Teutonic. And then I had these um, Amphora, and I said, okay, I'm going to do an, am an Amphora. And it's going to be, and then I thought, well, it'll be Roman, Celtic, Swiss. It's like, and my, my, I'm super been into like linguistics and history. So I found that like the Romans called Switzerland, Helvetia. So we came out with this Helveti that has like this pagan priest with a sheep on the front. <laughs> and, and so, you know, just things happen and you find ways. I feel like Nigel Tufnell and Spinal Tap, where he's like kicking the guitar and dragging the violin across the other. It's like, I find my expressive freedom in my solos. It, it's all ridiculous. It's all absurd. You turn the barrels up to 11 and just, it, and just mm -hmm. go from there. Oh, we had, we a, had wine. a wine called 11. Okay. And we, we had a Spinal Tap reference wines uh, foiled cucumber. We had 11 recorded in Dublin in Jazz Odyssey. And the bass player from Spinal Tap, Harry Shearer, has drank the Jazz Odyssey. <laughs> with another mutual friend. And we were gonna have Harry Shearer, we, we rebranded. And we were gonna have Harry Shearer draw the new labels on a mat napkin. And at the last minute he said, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't do it. It's a, for some complicated reason, but it would have been, having a spinal tap yeah, drawn label cool. would have been the best. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, the world ending a few months back. Tell me about the, the effects of this on your own personal business and kind of what what has changed for you and what changes as you as you look ahead for the future for Teutonic? Well, I gotta say I am very careful and I feel grief and sorrow for everybody that got sick there we were watching one of my favorite YouTube people died and I watched his widow talk about it yesterday for half an hour and it took him 45 days to die mm -hmm. and she's just wrecked in Oregon we've been fortunate but and when I call New York, everybody in the New York area has lost a relative or a friend. They had, they had reefer um, containers to keep dead bodies. But in Oregon, we're opening up because we need money and people are complacent and I'm worried. That said, I've never been happier. <laughs> like, I didn't realize, like, even though I talk like an extrovert, I'm, I mean, I've loved being by myself. I like the seclusion. I like the fact that our transportation and our infrastructure works again, that if I want to go to the vineyard, I can actually be at the vineyard in 25 minutes as opposed to an hour and a half. Um, I think that the time I do spend with people, we've slowed down and the value of friendship is so much better. And it's really reminded us of what's important in life. I think our business, sadly, is going to be more efficient in the future. I think socially the ramifications we're gonna have to like, and I'm sorry to get political. We're gonna if we don't embrace socialism now, it's gonna be a disaster because automation is already replacing people, and in COVID is gonna accelerate it dramatically. Very few, a lot of people are not gonna get rehired, and a lot of businesses will start telecommuting or outsourcing, and we need to prepare for this. I need to pay more taxes, and we all need to tighten our belt because the world is not gonna be the same. But We've tightened our belt. We've been so happy. <laughs> well, we have, we, the sad part is we did have to let go a lot of staff because we can't do live music anymore and we don't need a wait staff because we can't serve food or anything like that. So we're down to one person right now, um, which is too bad. I know that the other staff, they're being taken care of by the government. Thank you. I think they're going to all be okay. 
Um, but we realized how important direct-to-consumer business is, so we've been really uh, yeah. focusing on building our wine club and our online sales. And so I think when Barnaby said it will become more efficient, I think that's what he was relating to is mm -hmm. that um, – because I just never had enough time to focus on those things because I was constantly running around and picking up stuff at cash and carry and just – always behind schedule and now I can actually focus we're redoing our website <clears throat> so that'll be fun because it's been that we've had the same website for way too long and just I don't know I do feel like we're just able to look at our business closer and slower and really th more thoughtfully and we probably won't go back to doing all those events that we did all the time it yeah. was really tiring and I, I think we need to contextualize because somebody's watching this in 10 or 20 years the thing, when we laid people off, they, everybody got an extra $600 a week. So, which, to, to point a reference, the value of that is a lot of people are making double to triple what they made before they got laid off. And I have friends that have tried to rehire people and they say, if you rehire me, I'll quit. Why would I go to work to risk my life and make less money? And I, I do think that there's going to be also some social upheaval when that unemployment does run out and people have to go back to work and they're used to living on much more money and having a lot more free time. I don't know what's going to happen out of it. So yes, at the moment, our employees are much better off. And typically this time of the year is when I'm on the road for sales. I travel at least three months a year. Maybe not consecutive, I'll be on the road for three three weeks and then I get home, I'm jet lag, it beats the crap out of me, I'm sleeping on people's floors, staying up all night. And part part of this job is, you know, there's times where I feel like I'm like on the road, like I'm across between Motley Crue and Don Draper. They I you know, everybody wants to keep me out partying all night. You know, there was a, a night last spring where I was where it's daylight and I'm getting back to where I'm staying and I'm realizing oh, I have to work this morning. And and uh, I've become over 50 and I'm just doing it. I'm like Dick Clark, the world's oldest teenager. <laughs> and it is super fun, I enjoy it. But I, I also- It's also expensive. Enjoy hiding. Getting them on the road, the flights and all of that. And so our overheads really kind of slowed down, which is also really nice. I've been able to actually pay off a couple of credit cards. Yeah, and, and now we're doing Zoom meetings. It's all, it's all quite <laughs> yeah, strange, oh, but we're adapting to that. That I don't like. Yeah, it's, but, it's a weird new. It's a weird new way to yeah. people. Yeah, for sure. Well, you just look funny on the screen. And it's easier here because even though like this is not my first nature being in front of a camera, there's two of you there. I'm actually talking to faces as opposed to talking to a box. And then seeing yourself in the corner. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, tell me about um, as you became kind of part of the Oregon wine industry, especially the you mentioned kind of early on you. Were, you're one of the first urban wineries. Uh, urban winery movement obviously has blown up since. Tell me about what it looks like, what Oregon wine looked like when you joined it, and what has sort of changed between now and, and, and between then and now. Well, I think when we started, and this is like I'm speaking in big, swiping, broad strokes. Mm -hmm. And also, we weren't the first urban winery. Right. There was Hip Chicks Do Wine. Mm -hmm. When we started, everybody assumed we're urban because we lived in the city and our vibe. But before us, you know, Fos Peace had Sauvage. Uh, Tom and Kate had the Southeast Wine Collective, so we were not the first. But I would say we were very, very early in the new movement. And what's changed is people understand who we are in the context. It used to be a, a very strange and bizarre culture shock when we work with the distributor. And we didn't play by all these older established rules. And that was sort of the waning days. I mean, I guess Robert Parker isn't waning completely, but and probably I'll upset people. But you, you, you know, that was the most important thing. Wines were all about size, volume, and weight. And we were like, you know, like maybe like you know, you know, you had bands like the Stooges and the Kinks and the MC5. They kind of were punk. They didn't know they were punk, but they were early on, and people didn't know what format or what radio station to put you guys on. And I think that you know people probably didn't know what station they're listening to when they drank our wines. I like it. So you're like Iggy Pop. Of well, I don't know if I'm Iggy Pop, but maybe like his little brother or something. <laughs> but 
you know, I don't cut myself off up in the stage and run around naked, but yeah. Um, but yeah, there was definitely some pretty strange conversations like, you know, well, what you do this? What, why would people drink that? Why is it in this bottle? Why? We don't, we don't hear that anymore. What about as you look ahead now for yourselves and, and for the industry in general, what, what do you see for the future? And, and has, has the pandemic changed that at all? Well, I'm sure the pandemic has changed businesses for everybody. You know, I can't imagine anyone completely not being affected by it. Mm -hmm. Even if they're not directly affected by it, they're going to be affected by it eventually because those businesses that interact will. Um, I think a lot of wineries are doing the same thing we're doing, you know, building up direct to consumer wine clubs, just being able to sell more wine online. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our distributors for a while were really panicked and we were panicked too, whether we would really get paid. You know, we shipped out a lot of wine in the spring and then everything shut down. But somehow they've managed to sell enough wine to <coughs> wine shops and grocery stores mm -hmm. and to pay us. And maybe some of them also got some loans. So we're doing okay. We're getting paid, it's a little bit slow. Um, and I've reduced prices as well to help them. Um, so we all kind of like helped each other, I think. And we, I think it's too early to know right now if it's gonna go back to normal, whatever that is. I mean, we, they're sort of reopening, but will they have to close again? Mm -hmm. I don't know. We're not gonna reopen until we're really sure that we don't have to close again. Yeah, and, and also, you know, I, I, I say is, you know, the idea is, do, does the economy exist for the people or do the people exist for the economy? And I'm maybe, you know, trying to make European wines, and I also think I have European values of humanity, and I think that business and capitalism exists for people. And I think if I open early and I found out one person's in a body bag mm -hmm. because I opened so I could pay some bills, I would feel dreadful. It's, it's not necessary. So we're going to wait like at least a month to make sure that the numbers aren't going up and that we're not going to hurt people for the convenience of selling more wine. And, you know, I've seen restaurants that are now open. They have the sidewalk seating. And the tables are so far apart and the wait staff's wearing a mask. And it just doesn't really look appealing to me. Dining in a hospital. Me. But you know what? People are still, you know, you, your masks are off when you're eating. Right. And... And, you know, and I'm sure, like, like, if people are watching this, I know, like, what? didn't you guys know that if you <laughs> eat oranges, that cured it? People are like, you guys are, you guys had this all wrong. I mean, don't you know, like, bacon fat, you know, we don't, I mean, sure that, you know, we're so early mm -hmm. that in 10 years they're going to figure some, you know, the next oh, there'll year. There'll be a vaccine of some kind, but, um, yeah, yeah, but right until, now it's really scary, and it takes so long to develop. Someone could have it for weeks. Someone may never have any symptoms. Mm -hmm. Now we're reading about young people get coming up positive but not showing signs. So they can be like running around and spreading it to their family members. And mm -hmm. I don't know. It's really a scary thing. On the wine side of things, is there anything you're looking forward to trying or doing, a new variety you want to work with or a new new challenge? Yeah, lot, lots of stuff. Uh, the Sauvignon, or Treminer as they call it in German. Lemberger. Uh, Lemberger, Goy Blanc. Um, I'd like to work with a lot of the older, like esoteric Middle Ages kind of grapes. Um, yeah, I think that's. They're just hard to find. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe get some people to plant some of the stuff or graft it over. Um, so that's something that's really changed in the industry, it seems like. People are much more willing to plant esoteric mm -hmm. varietals yeah. mm -hmm. uh you have have you fa have you been able to find more things you're looking for i assume more recently uh, yeah more, more variety out there and ironically from the oldest sources like we you know we worked with some uh um uh, what, what oh a uh, sauvignon rose or what is it called Tr um oh Tr treminer but it's rotor treminer rotor treminer yeah. which we could we had to call it treminer because the ttb doesn't even believe that grape's real and there's like a few rows of it and it was oh and and so we're trying to find out like everything we could about it and i have a a friend that's a geisenheim in germany and he went up to the wine historian and he found a couple documents and one of the documents from like the 1680s 
the church decreed that women couldn't drink that grape because it made them lose their mind, which made me like, oh my God, I've got to make so much of this. <laughs> I or, missed or it's that like, story. I didn't oh even, my God, yeah. I can't Yo- believe you didn't tell Johannes, me. Johannes, I did. And you, it's like when we can't hear each other because we're married. It's a, good, it's a good thing we're here. To say I would have okay. remembered that. So, so yeah, and it's like, so also, you know, I think women just, you know, feminism and defiance Drink this. Don't let those guys tell you you can't drink, you know, <laughs> Rotor Treminer. I sense a great wine label coming from that story. Oh, we have a label. It's 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 so cute. Oh, what is on the label? The, um, the Rotor the, Treminer. It's a little ice age. It's like um like a glacier crushing a, a vineyard mammoth. with but, a mammoth on it. Oh, because back, it's called the Little Ice Age? Back, yeah, is part of the mountains. It's really so cool. Little Ice Age was a period from, like, I think the 12th through the 17th century where... Um, glaciers actually did impede on vineyards in Europe. It was terrible. Actually, it created a great famine, and it was a real th- sort of thing. And I'm I'm into history and these kinds of things. And if I can get trick people into thinking about history when they drink my wines, um, I, I feel like I we did something. We try to put the story on the back label. It has to be really condensed, but we want people to know why we're doing what we're doing. But also the future, I think diversification. I think there's going to be... The way you just grow the pie, there's gonna be more varieties out there, more styles, more freedom of expression, more creativity. I don't think that the growth is gonna come from, you, know, you can read why Mrs. Monthly and this is the future is this. Yeah, it probably is. But I think the future is gonna be everything and people working harder, making it better. I think the price point, for better or worse, for the most part, is gonna be competitive. If, we, if our wives get above glass point, glass poor price point they slow to a stop so we always had to find a way to keep our wines glass pourable maybe not in portland but at least in san francisco new york and la yeah i see the price of wine kind of going down in general i think the 90 to 150 dollar bottles are going to be pretty tough to sell i mean there'll always be collectors and there'll always be people rich business millionaire right. businessmen that will want to add some kind of whatever to their uh, you know, seller, but I think in general, the sweet spots between like probably 15 to 25, mm-hmm. and I'd say most of our wines are around the, um, a little higher than 15, but around 20, yeah. 20, 25, and then our reds are about 30, 33. Which is like the le- least we can sell it for, not and quite We don't a make $33 on each bottle. <laughs> I just want to make that clear. Well, most of our wine we sell off OB, so then, yeah. you know, it goes out in distribution, so. Yeah, if we could sell that DT direct to consumer at that price, we'd be, the house would be already painted, and, and you wouldn't have fell through my deck. <laughs> I was hoping that wouldn't end up on the final version of this, but that's okay. I've that's <laughs> my fault for having a crappy deck. And we don't want to make more wine. We just want to sell more wine with a higher profit margin. Mm-hmm. More so direct to consumer. Exactly, yeah. You talked about being in markets outside of, era, outside of the area, outside of the state. Uh, I'm curious about breaking into those kind of markets, you, you, those are some, those are some obviously tough places to get into, San Francisco, New York, high demand for, for, uh, for wines there. So how did you find your way into those kind of markets? That's a really good question. It's kind of different depending on the state. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's a friend that hooks us up and says, you know, I'm going to talk to my buddy, he's the distributor in Massachusetts, and, you know, we'll send him some samples, mm-hmm. and they try it, and they're like, you want to join our catalog? Great. Mm-hmm. Other times we'll reach out. Sometimes we'll just get an email. It's kind of been yeah. a bunch of different well, ways. Well, Johannes Zelbach told Matthew Plumpton, our, our California oh, yeah. guy, about us. And he said, there's this weird guy in Oregon doing German style. You should check it out. Um, I don't know how we got into Washington. That was our first distributor was Cavatappi. It was through <gasps> Stephanie. Oh, the you know, ones. Yeah. yeah, okay. And... And, but mostly, I think it's just been it's weird word of mouth. It's always kind of a story. Yeah. yeah, it's usually word of mouth. Um, we're in about 30. I always forget exactly how many states we're in. I mean, there's some states that don't buy very much. I mean, I've got a couple of states where maybe I'll send them like 10 cases of wine for the whole year. Mm-hmm. And then there's others where I'm like sending out constantly, sending out wine. And you, you never know. Like some years. And it can change. Minneapolis. Just a city in Minneapolis will buy more wine than California. It's just. It's very he strange. He just loves us. And um, if so the we, wine buyer changes and they leave, then sometimes they're not as interested in you anymore. It's, you know, you just have to kind of stay on top of it, I think, and keep a relationship going. And we ask for depletion reports. And if they're not doing very well, 
we'll talk to them and say, you know, we'll send Barnaby out. Sometimes I've gone out. Um, you know, if you will buy enough wine, we'll come out and visit and do ride-alongs and tastings. And that was like our Barnaby best. Barnaby will entertain you. Social media, it's like Olga's pouring in one place, us pouring another. Said Olga and Barnaby are splitting up. <laughs> and oh yeah. <laughs> and I check it out. We're splitting well, up. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. And oh. Olga will be here, and I'll be there. But someone took it seriously, though, right? But who was? I can't remember. It's like it was if you yeah, if you could read past the first sentence, you would have known. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm curious about actually about that about uh, being married and and having a business together and the the, the <laughs> how have you made it work? Good. We just tolerate bullshit a little bit. <laughs> I mean, we we all you know I'm sure do things that like you know. Are challenging to the other but you know you sometimes we don't hear each other apparently that's we don't hear to be. each other it's like it's a true thing um i i'd say overall though it's been a good thing um because i don't even know what it would be we like we trust to have a each other yeah and yeah and i think that like our experience in this we've evolved together we've grown together we started together so we have a similar perspective but different skill sets mm -hmm. and you know i like to tinker so i can fix a forklift and olga does all the computerizing things and <laughs> and, and it's called marketing and sales and reports. But it all comes out of a computer, though. You're also yeah. You sound, sound like my mom. <laughs> she does something with the computer. Um, but we also kind of get what our company is like. So if Barnaby can't meet with someone, I can meet with them, and they might get a little bit of a different experience. But we both have a very good understanding of who we are and what we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's really helpful. And neither one of us is going to bail. <laughs> At least I don't think. <laughs> so we don't have to worry about that happening, and we don't have investors that want their ROI, and when are we going to get our big return on investment? So it does, it works, you know? And then when you're on the road, we don't see each other sometimes for a really long period of time. Now we're in COVID times, so we're together a lot. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> you know, it felt so anxious at first, and now it's just like normal, you know? Like you see your buddy, you put your mask on, and... You know, I think humanity is a very flexible and very adaptable thing. And we think, we can't imagine, like, how could people live in these circumstances? And now, we it's like second nature. And I think, you know, wearing this is showing other people respect. It's not that I'm afraid of you. It's that I'm being gracious. And I'm showing you that I value your help. And, um, yeah. It'll, this is such a weird time. Yeah. Hope it never happens again. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like you said earlier, it's tough to know what it's going to look like after, but it's hard to imagine it being the same. Mm -hmm. But here's a, when's the last time you've had a friend that's had the flu or the cold? People don't get sick. If you, if you don't get COVID, you're not going to get sick. Mm -hmm. Nobody is getting colds or flus anymore. People answer their phones more. I noticed that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you kind of, kind of have a lot of uh, captive audiences out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, well, one last question for you. I'm going to get a little philosophical because this feels like a good question for you, too. So what is wine's role in society? Mm. I think its role is to make people happy. It's all about enjoyment. Mm -hmm. And something that people look forward to at the end of the day or for the weekend, special occasions. Sometimes it can just be a picnic wine, but it just adds something special to what you're doing or what you're eating or when you're spending time with friends it loosens you up a little bit it's never boring because you can buy a different kind of wine anytime yeah it's what you make it too I think it's if you listen to music some people put music on as wallpaper and those are people that I think that's like drinking to get drunk and other people put on the heaviest stuff they can so it's just it's art so what do you want it to be where do you want to go and it's ultimately whoever's drinking gets to decide and that's one of the cool things about making a product that becomes whatever anybody wants. And I would recommend folks to try wines that you haven't had. You know, don't just drink the same wine every time. If you're used to drinking, a, you know, a Cabernet Sauvignon, you know, experiment a little bit and see what else is out there. There are a lot of great wines, and don't be, don't fear the Riesling. <laughs> it's a great wine. It would be our desert island wine, as a matter of fact. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. All the questions I have. Is there yeah. anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover that we should have covered? I think we got mm -hmm. a lot. 
Yeah, and of course, you know, as soon as yeah. you leave, I'll think then of we'll something. Then we'll be like, ah. Of I can't believe I didn't the say that. The nature of this thing. Yeah. That, that's but. okay. Well, thank you both so much for joining us. Thank Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Here in your urban vineyard, which is a first for me. This is amazing. <laughs> uh, and we'll go ahead and let you guys off the hook. If you need.